So there's a case called United States versus West. It's a 2004 case in the D.C. Circuit. And the court held that the advice of counsel defense actually does not hold water when the counsel in question is a co-conspirator. Now, the indictment doesn't make clear if Eastman and Giuliani are co-conspirators, unindicted co-conspirators, but we can make an educated guess that they are. And so both because there is this precedent that tells us Trump's advice of counsel defense might not hold water because he followed the advice of possibly a co-conspirator, and also because there were many more attorneys that were saying, you can't do this, and he willfully ignored their advice and followed the advice of two other people. It seems like this defense might not be the strongest for his case. I'm Natalie Orped, Executive Editor of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 21st, 2023. It's only been a few weeks since Special Counsel Jack Smith indicted Donald Trump. But both he and his lawyers have already been previewing their case in defense, that he was protected by the First Amendment, that he relied on the advice of counsel, and the glue holding it all together, that he really believed what he was saying. We recently published two articles on the subject in Lawfare. The first, by Lawfare Editor-in-Chief Benjamin Wittes and legal fellow Serafine Danani, assesses Trump's likely defenses. The second, by Lawfare Senior Editor Roger Parloff, argues that a jury may well see through them. I sat down with Ben, Seraphine, and Roger to talk through it all. It's the Lawfare Podcast, August 21st, 2023. Does it matter whether Trump believed his own lies? Ben, Roger, and Seraphine, let us talk about the defenses that we have been seeing as previewed by both Donald Trump himself and particularly his attorneys, one of whom... Loro went on the Sunday shows, I believe, last weekend and gave a full barrage of the types of arguments that we can expect him to make in the January 6th case in the district court in D.C. that's brought by special counsel Jack Smith. So Ben and Serafine, you wrote a piece for Lawfare talking about the four different defenses that you see as emerging Uh, themes based on what Laura raised in the shows. So I want to walk through those quickly, the first three of which you explored in detail and the fourth of which you're going to follow up with in a subsequent article. So let's talk first about this idea of the First Amendment. We've been hearing a lot of this from Laura, but also especially from Trump saying, you know, I had the right to say all of this. This was just free speech. They're trying to stifle me. So, Seraphine, what exactly is the First Amendment argument? The First Amendment argument, according to Loro, is that Trump's ellipse speech, his petitioning Pence to, quote, pause the electoral count, and his call to the Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, to find some 11,870 votes, these were all forms of political speech. And that distinction is important, and Loro says that very intentionally, because political speech in the United States has the highest protection than any other form of speech under the First Amendment. And so the crimes that Trump is charged uh, include the conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, to defraud the United States, conspiracy also to interfere with the right to vote. And Loro is seeming to argue that these are all acts of political speeches. And so they cannot rise to the level of conspiracy. They are all First Amendment protected. So Ben, can you drill down a little bit on how they are using this notion of political speech to undermine the different elements of the crimes that Serafine mentioned, the case that the prosecution has to make with respect to those crimes? So uh, as an initial matter, the argument that Mr. DeLauro is making here is that Trump, you know, did a lot of talking and talking is presumptively First Amendment protected. And by the way, you know, a lot of the supposed bad acts um, that Trump engaged in, including the pressure on Mike Pence and the, you know, pressure on Brad Raffensperger, 
are in Laura's view merely petitions for redress of grievance uh, under the First Amendment. So there's a couple things to say about this as an initial matter. The first is that there's a certain amount of nonsense in here. Almost all conspiracies are made up of spoken words. And the, the, the thing that separates a lot of protected speech from criminal conspiracy is your specific intent and your mens rea at the time that you say something. So if you're, you know, an insurance policy salesman selling a homeowner's insurance policy and you say, that's a nice house you've got there, it would be a real shame if something happened to it, please buy State Farm, you know, right? That's First Amendment protected speech. If you're Don Corleone and you say it's a nice house and, you know, it would be a shame if something happened to it, and you do it with specific intent to threaten a witness, that is not protected speech. And right, so what what Laro is doing is he's saying all of these things could be protected speech. And that really puts a premium on the element of the offense that is intent uh, and what Jack Smith can show about the defendant's intent. Uh, we'll get to that because that's the entire subject of Roger's article. There is one case here that I think is potentially helpful to Donald Trump, and that is the Supreme Court's 1980s era case, Claiborne Hardware uh, v. NAACP. Uh, and this is a complicated case. It involves a boycott organized by the NAACP against, you know, a Georgia hardware store that had, uh, there were legal elements to the boycott. There were also violent and illegal elements to it. And the Supreme Court basically said, hey, you know, you can't hold libel First Amendment protected activity because other people involved in the in the corporate and in, in the project i.e the boycott were engaged in illegality you know in a mixed arrangement of legal and first amendment protect illegal and first amendment protected activity you have to show to hold person x liable you have to show that that person had specific intent to further the illegal aims of the conspiracy. Otherwise, you're punishing First Amendment speech. I think that case actually gives Trump some stuff to work with. It's not going to succeed on a motion to dismiss, but it might, particularly in combination with some of the other defenses Laro is talking about, you know, it, it's not inconceivable that this could move one or more jurors. Okay, so I think just on the face of it, as is probably clear by how much we're hearing about this in the press, the First Amendment argument is a compelling one. We have a culture that feels very strongly about free speech and the other rights that are secured by the First Amendment. Can I just say that I actually don't think on its own it's a compelling one. I think it has it has a, in combination with some of the other defenses, it, it may have some legs. But I think if, if all Laura were out there saying was the First Amendment, the First Amendment, the First Amendment, I, I think his argument would be, you know, relatively trivial. Yes, I agree. And I meant in a rhetorical sense. That is the trying the case in the public eye piece of it, not the legal argument that is compelling. So I wondered, uh, Roger, you've been, in addition to writing this excellent piece that we will get to later, you have been tracking the trials of January 6th defendants, particularly those who are involved with the actual attack on the Capitol for a long, long time now. And I'm wondering if you have seen raised by any of those defendants, a similar sort of First Amendment argument that they were engaged in political speech or they were petitioning their government and therefore their conduct should be protected by the First Amendment? Yeah, it's been, uh, certainly it's been raised a lot. It's, but usually in contexts where it was uh, pretty frivolous and it never got traction because you know the the people were engaged in violence or they brought they had weapons with them and they were in restricted zones and but it will be an issue 
in at least some of the Proud Boys cases on, on appeal, at least their defend their lawyers have promised to raise it. The way it arises there is that those are conspiracy cases. And of course, the proof involves a lot of conversations that were going on in encrypted chats and, and, and other places beginning in November and extending all the way to January 6th, where they're discussing highly seditious political ideas. And all of that is would be, you know, First Amendment protected if they hadn't attended January 6th, if they hadn't gone. But of course, some did, uh, a lot did, <laughs> about 200 did, and uh, there was violence. And so what they're saying is, well, the violence was uh, spontaneous. You know, it was a spontaneous riot. We participated, but you're taking our First Amendment protected speech over the previous two months and sort of back backloading it and making it look like we were plotting all along. So that's an interesting argument, but I think it's mainly a factual argument about, you know, whether or not there was uh, planning and uh, a plot. And obviously the jury resolved that against them. But uh, I think that's the most vivid First Amendment argument that comes to mind. Okay. So, Seraphine, I want to go next to another defense that you had identified in your piece, which is the defense that Trump was acting on the advice of counsel when he engaged in this conduct that Jack Smith has identified as allegedly criminal. Can you walk us through what that defense would look like? Sure. So the advice of counsel defense has about three elements that must be proven, uh, at least in Trump's case. So he has to show that he sought that advice honestly and in good faith prior to any of the alleged criminal activity, uh, that he fully and honestly placed all the facts before his counsel when he was explaining uh, his side and when he was seeking advice that he was transparent. And then finally, uh, he had to have followed the counsel's advice in good faith. And he must have honestly believed that it was correct and that he intended his activity to be lawful. Here, I think that the prosecutors have some legs to stand on because for every lawyer that encouraged Trump to petition Mike Pence and, quote, ask for a pause in the in the electoral count or his petition to Raffensperger to find 11,870 votes. All of those uh, aspirational asks, as Laurel puts them, were certainly encouraged by his counsel. But for every one of those attorneys that encouraged that activity, there were many more that were advising him against it. And so it seems like Trump willfully ignored advice of many other lawyers who were casting doubt on Giuliani and on John Eastman's theories. And then there's also precedent here that the court can work with. So there's a case called United States versus West. It's a 2004 case in the DC circuit. And the court held that the advice of counsel defense actually does not hold water when the counsel in question is a co-conspirator. Now, the indictment doesn't make clear if Eastman and Giuliani are co-conspirators, unindicted co-conspirators, but we can make an educated guess that they are. And so both because there is this precedent that tells us Trump's advice of counsel defense might not hold water because he followed the advice of possibly a co-conspirator, and also because there were many more attorneys that were saying, you can't do this. And he willfully ignored their advice and followed the advice of two other people. It seems like this defense might not be the strongest for his case. Yeah. So it's almost the, he took the advice of a minority of his counsel among the many, many lawyers he was surrounded with at the time. Sort of the, is the significance of the disregarding of so many lawyers. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. And he took the advice of the minority with whom he happened to be conspiring. Right. 
Ben, on that point, actually, how would the prosecution go about proving that? Because as Seraphine said, it seems from reporting and sort of deducing from the indictment that we know two of the unindicted co-conspirators are Eastman and Giuliani, both of whom were among the minority encouraging Trump to engage in this allegedly criminal activity. Ben, you wrote for us a while ago about a case that seems unrelated, but goes to this same theme of how do you evaluate a conspiracy or whether someone meets the threshold of being a co-conspirator without that being squarely before the court or before the jury. Can you talk to us about that and how you think that would play out here in terms of knowing that neither Giuliani nor Eastman are named co-conspirators in the indictment? Well, of course, they're not named, but they are identified and and they will be named at trial. So I, it's quite clear that the, the lawyers on whose counsel he was relying are identified in the indictment as co-conspirators. Look, the, the, the problem here is again, if you if you focus in on Sarafin's identification of the sort of key elements of, of this defense, is that again, it all comes down to intent. If leaving aside this co-conspirator matter, but if Trump were to argue the advice of counsel defense, and I agree with Sarafin that it's the the on its own, it's very weak. You know, you, he would have to establish or convince a jury that he genuinely was following these people's advice in good faith, having presented all the facts uh, before them. And that did not happen. And it's not just that he followed the minority of lawyers, he followed the less competent I mean, he had very good lawyers uh, like Pat Feldman and and Pat Cipollone, uh, who were arguing precisely the opposite of of this. The better the lawyer he was dealing with, the more likely they were to be more stridently on the other side of this. And so, I think he would have a very hard time establishing that he relied in good faith on this advice of counsel even apart from the issue of there being co-conspirators, it seems to me the significance of the advice of counsel defense is, again, as a part of a kind of synthetic defense, right, where you say he was expressing First Amendment protected activity to the extent it relied on a legal theory. He had John Eastman, a, a real law professor, and, you know, and Supreme former Supreme Court clerk advising him of that, and you know we're going we're going to get into the other element momentarily. But I think the you know the extent to which the advice of counsel defense has any legs here, it's really as a supporting element of the other two, the the free speech and the sort of larger good faith, really believe that he'd won the election kind of defense. And I and I think the the key element there is again, it turns on what he can convince a jury or a juror uh, he actually believed in good faith. Yeah. And it seems to me one of the challenges is that, as you said, one of the distinctions between the minority of lawyers who were encouraging this versus advising him against them you know, he could retort that it's a subjective assessment of who the better lawyer was. Roger, I want to turn to you because we were talking about how this has come up in other January 6th cases. And you were telling me about an instance where it seemed that the defendants were going to raise an advice of counsel argument, but decided not to. Can you talk to us about that? Yes, that came up in the Oath Keepers conspiracy the first seditious conspiracy case. And the facts are a little odd, but if you remember the founder and the head of the Oath Keepers, uh, Stuart Rhodes, his girlfriend was a lawyer named uh, Kelly Sorrell. And uh, she was an Oath Keeper too. And uh, there's a dispute about whether she was the Oath Keepers general counsel. Certainly after they were arrested, 
the Oath Keepers began to describe her uh, that way retroactively, uh, the government felt that that was just a way to try to shield, you know, her phone and and his her messages with Rhodes in uh, attorney-client privilege. But in any event, when right after January sixth, um, you know, like on January sixth that evening, they go they a lot of them go to an Olive Garden and sort of talk over the day, and then at midway through. Uh, Rhodes gets, I don't know if he gets word that people are being arrested, but they, they panic, they all flee and they, they flee in a big rush. And somebody, probably Rhodes, types on her phone, destroy all your signal chats, these texted messages that they've been using for months, encrypted texts they've been using for months. The person also writes on Kelly Sorrell's phone, Nobody has subpoenaed this yet. It's okay if you destroy it now. So a lot of non-lawyer oath keepers, you know, who saw that could have raised the defense. Well, I thought our general counsel was telling us it was okay. So that would be a defense to obstructing justice. That advice is wrong. That, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not true that you can destroy your phone. You know, you can wipe the phone with, with impunity so long as there's been no subpoena. But a non-lawyer wouldn't know that. That would be a good use of the uh, advice of counsel defense. But as it turned out, if you invoke advice of counsel defense, you have to give notice and then you waive that lawyer's attorney-client privilege. So all of Kelly Sorrell's, you know, messages would have become a fair game. And I, I think as a group, the Oath Keepers decided that that would be worse for everybody than trying to use this advice of counsel defense, and it was never made. Yeah. And I, I did want to raise that just because I think it's an interesting side note to the assessment of whether it would be wise, as Seraphine and Ben talked about from a legal perspective, which as they described, it seems weak. But another implication of using it is the possibility that you would need to open up for discovery any communications between them that could otherwise be perhaps shielded by privilege, although that gets more complicated when it's the president. But let us turn now to the meat of both Ben and Serafine's article and Roger's article, which is this notion that we are hearing a lot of from the Trump camp, that Trump really, truly, sincerely believed that he had won the election and therefore all of his conduct was legal. Serafine, can you talk us through what that defense looks like and how you assessed it? Sure. So I think the First Amendment defense is getting a lot of attention, but I think this defense that Trump believed in his heart of hearts that he won the election is actually more critical because it's, I would say, the foundation of all the other defenses. And I think it's because it gets to his mental state. Did he have the criminal intent, the corrupt intent to conspire to, for example, defraud the United States government? or to obstruct an official proceeding. And if Trump is saying, well, no, there's no way I, I could have because I genuinely believed I won the election and I was within my right to petition the government to ask that the electoral account be paused, that was all in furtherance of this mental state that I had, which is that the election was won by me. And that is important because what that means is prosecutors now have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, and that's a pretty high standard here, that Trump's mental state, that his belief uh, that he had won the election was ill-conceived, that that's actually pretty disingenuous. And I think that there's quite a bit of evidence on the prosecutor's side, but I don't think it is a slam dunk on the prosecutor side. I think they have a lot that they have to build in order to show the jury that Trump actually did not believe he won the presidency. And of course, there's evidence of Trump on tape and and there are witnesses who will come forward who will talk about how Trump really didn't believe that he won the election. But it really gets to the mental state. 
And then where we left off, which was on this question of advice of counsel, for example, that's one way where his mental state of feeling like he won the election comes into play. If he truly believed that he won the election and he's going to counsel and relying on their advice when they're telling him that he can petition the government and he can express his grievances in a certain way, well, that lends some credibility to his argument. So let's talk a a little bit more about the interaction here. Ben, you had described it as sort of a synthetic defense combining this notion of belief with the other defenses that we've already gone through. Can you talk us through that a bit more? Yeah. So I think this is one of these situations where each of these defenses on its own sucks. And the question is whether the sum of the three of them are worth more than the, the individual parts. And I think the answer is yes. I, how much more, I don't know. But let's say I, the centerpiece of it, for the reason Serafin says, really has to be this genuine belief argument, because it kind of kills the mens rea. But I think the, the, the basic synthetic argument would look like this. He genuinely believed that he won the election. In that belief, he was supported by respectable counsel, you know, a former U.S. attorney and associate attorney general in Rudy Giuliani and a former Supreme Court clerk and uh, law professor in John Eastman. Uh, The fact that they were both crackpots, as it turned out, isn't really his fault. So he genuinely believed this. He had respectable lawyers telling him. And in the pursuit of that, he engaged in aggressive advocacy, which in the absence of a showing of criminal intent and specific intent to to commit crimes is First Amendment protected. And so I I think that's that's the synthetic defense. And the question is whether you can, you know, argue it to a jury in a fashion that is compelling to one of 12. And I, I, I would say likely not, given the magnitude of the, of the evidence that Jack Smith is bringing to the table. But I think if you add these three defenses together and you kind of synthesize them a little bit, they actually do a little bit, a bit of work that none of them can do on their own. All right, Roger. So this is really the starting point of your piece, which is looking at this notion of whether Trump truly believed what he was saying and what he purports to have believed. And the premise of your article is that it's not actually necessary to get into the nuances of the laws and the specifications of exactly how this applies, because the fact of the matter is that prosecutors will be able to prove to a jury that Donald Trump did not believe that he had won the election. So talk to us about how you are coming to that conclusion. Yeah, there's a couple things. And one just begins with, with I think that people are overthinking this a bit, that you know, we do think that Trump has an unusual state of mind because we know that he has this refusal to face facts. And it seems like, well, how are we ever going to prove subjectively that he's uh, he's lying? You know, we re- remember the uh, he uh, insisted for a very long time that Barack Obama was uh, born in uh, Kenya. So but I think While Trump's refusal to face facts is unusual uh, for an ex-president, it's not unusual for a white-collar criminal. And juries don't have a problem with this, typically. I think a very recent example is Elizabeth Holmes, a pretty, you know, somebody completely incapable of seeing herself in the wrong. But, But you go back, Jeff Skilling of Enron was another example. I, I think there are a tremendous number of examples that just did not rise very, are, are lesser known. I, a long time ago, I did some white collar practice. And this, this, this is how many of these people are. It's why they get into trouble. And jurors, when they hear people uh, pervasively and relentlessly saying things that are false, they tend to think, oh, I get it. They're lying. And it's not 
you know, they've met liars. They don't like them. And I think that that this is what will happen. And And the other thing that people aren't getting is if you really look at the indictment and it's, you know, it's dense, it's just this panorama of uh, mendacity and malevolence and red flags of bad faith. And we underestimate, uh, you know, and jurors, unlike everyone else who, you know, just reads an article or reads a headline, really, or, or hears something on TV, they marinate in this. You know, they're in with this for weeks. So you can't bluff with them. You can't give them, you know, little soundbite defenses. Those backfire. And so what I did in my article is I, I looked at those false statements and other indicia of, of bad faith and malevolence, and I uh, divided that uh, into, uh, I came down with uh, ultimately uh, that there were eight, what I called anchor lies. And I, I don't think I'm making this up. I mean, six of them are highlighted in paragraph 11 of the indictment. These are the these are the whopper election lies, which, he, you know, he's going to show that Trump made over and over and over, despite numerous authorities explaining to him that they were false. And, and then in addition to those anchor lies, you have 16 ancillary lies, many of which are breathtaking. There are six of what I call flapping red flags of bad faith. These are the ones you've all heard. These are things like, find me 11,780 votes, or him saying to Vice President Pence, you're too honest, or him saying to uh, to Attorney General Rosen, uh, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me. And then on top of that, even, you have nine instances of uh, just really shocking malevolence where he's a willingness to to malign or or defame or even risk injury to innocent people who get in his way. People like those low-level election workers, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. And so on TV, you can talk about, yeah, well, you know, he really believed it. But when you when you get in the swamp, uh, it's just it's just overwhelming. It's just crazy. Yeah. So I'm wondering, Seraphine, maybe I can come to you. This picture that that Roger paints, I think, especially about the cumulative effect of day after day or after day of evidence of these lies. Do you think that the defenses that you and Ben had identified, for example, the this was political speech defense? is still what they're going to come to in the face of this day after day after day identifying these lies that they'll say, well, these weren't lies. This was just political speech. Or how do you think that they're going to deal with that? I don't know what else they would argue. I think the indictment alleging that these are speech acts that are being criminalized makes the First Amendment argument very attractive. And I think, and this is what we talk about in the article too, it's really going to come down to evidence and say what you will about the different sides and what theory they they put forth. I think the evidence that they provide is really what's going to sway the jury. Ben, what are your thoughts? So I think that, first of all, I think Roger is almost certainly right that we are all overthinking this because, you know, Everything that that we've been talking about in terms of these other defenses, as we've discussed, turns on this question of what can you show about the president's uh, criminal intent and mens rea. And if Roger is right that Jack Smith can just flood the zone with material on that, and that you know jurors actually know what to do with mendacity of that order, which is that they decide that the defendant is a lying sack of shit, and that resolves the criminal intent questions, then Trump is in really big trouble. And so I think there's only one way to respond for the Trump defense, 
And that is exactly the way Trump responds in the political arena or Trump's defenders respond in the political arena, which is to take on each and every one of these obviously mendacious and obviously corrupt uh, behaviors and pretend that they're normal. And so I think you will see a cross exam, a brutal cross examination of, of Mr. Raffensperger in which Trump's lawyers try to show that he was not in fact being asked to do anything illegal. He was merely being asked by a guy who genuinely believed that he had won for the kind of honest investigation that would prove what he believed. Now, do I believe that's accurate? Absolutely not. Do I think a juror, do I think Roger is right that a juror is, almost all jurors will will see through this very quickly? Yes. But Trump doesn't have a choice but to make this argument about that, about the Pence stuff. Uh, and the means by which he will do it is by attacking the people who are making these allegations and trying to establish that in each and every one of these instances, his request was A, normal, and B, merely a request. But look, if Roger is right that a jury is going to take one look at the evidence of lying and mendacity and corrupt intent and say, this guy is a criminal, which, by the way, would be right. But if if that's the way a jury is going to respond, then none of these other defenses will have legs because you know, the First Amendment doesn't entitle you to demand things with the specific intent to commit crimes, right? It doesn't allow you to lie by way of causing people to engage in illegal activity uh, that you specifically intend to do. You know, none of these defenses work if the jury doesn't have reasonable doubt that Trump is, I think the technical legal term is a lying sack of shit. So, Roger, I want to come back to you to press on this a little bit. I I found incredibly compelling the notion that people underestimate juries, that this is a phenomenon that juries need to confront all the time in white collar cases. But I think we have to acknowledge, as you did up top in your piece, that Trump has a unique ability to convince people of things that seem utterly absurd, as you said, the example of really forming a a whole movement around this idea that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, for example. So just to press on you a little bit, if we're to take as given that Trump has a capacity that really very few other people, if any, seem to have to successfully convince a large group of people about things, of things that seem facially false, why are you so confident that he won't be able to bring that into a courtroom here? Is it just that the Trump supporters who are susceptible to that sort of agreement will have come out of the jury pool, or is there something else? Well, people that are completely enamored of him now, that are you know devoted to him now and committed to him now, should be vetted out of the jury pool. The other thing is that Trump is not usually, when he's convincing people of things, he's not usually in a court of law subject to evidentiary rules. He's not being cross-examined by a prosecutor who's prepared, who's prepared like no one he's ever met before. I think that uh, we we really don't have a lot of experience comparing how voters respond to rhetoric in a stadium uh, when it's just him or, you know, in a uh, town halls when it's basically just him. That's nothing resembling what what a courtroom will be like. And we don't even know if he'll dare testify which has its own risks. And uh, so I'm dubious that that's going to make a huge difference. Okay. And so, Seraphine and Ben, I'm curious for your thoughts, having laid out the complications from a legal perspective 
on each of these defenses. But also considering Roger's point, do you think that the the Trump team will try to raise doubts on these legal points that you have identified and and try to make legal arguments? Or do you think that they will try to attack this barrage of evidence that Roger has described? Or will it be both? Or would doing one detract from the other? Well, as, as I said before, if Roger's analysis proves correct, and I suspect it will, the rest of the case is indefensible, right? The only way to defend this case is to prove Roger wrong. And that is to convince some, it it can only, it can be as few as one juror that Trump was in fact acting in good faith, that he's not in the Jeffrey Skelling or, or Elizabeth Holmes category, that he's something else, that he's an earnest ideologue of some sort. I, I don't know, because I'm so far from that mindset myself. But the it seems to me, if you can't do that, for at least one juror, there is no way to win this case. And so I look, I very much agree with Roger's piece, uh, with Roger's argument. My point is, and the, the point that Sarafin and I were are making, I actually don't think the two pieces are in tension with one another. If you listen to the defense that they sketched out, they are attacking Roger's premise, right? They're saying, we're going to establish that he was operating in good faith and flowing from that, that his activity should be understood in the rubric of the First Amendment, not in the rubric of conspiracy. And that to the extent, and they're going to they're going to downplay this because the the individual argument is so weak. And to the extent that he was argue, acting in good faith, he had real lawyers telling him real reasons to believe what he believed. But I totally agree with Roger that if 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 he can't establish to one juror the good faith point, there's no way for him to win this case. Seraphine, what do you think about how the Trump team will build its defense in this sense? I agree with Ben. I think one minor point that I also want to make is Ben mentioned that there is this case, NAACP versus Claiborne Hardware, that is pretty favorable to Trump. There is one point in that case where I think prosecutors can use it for it for their benefit. And it's this point that Trump's political speech, if he's even able to convince jurors that it is political speech, that can still be used to corroborate his illegal intent or whatever his intent might have been. So even in cases that seem to work for Trump, there is a lot of opportunity for prosecutors to come in and create or argue for an intent that is criminal. And so I agree with Roger, I agree with Ben, but even putting those facts aside, I think the law is not totally with the defense team at this point. And so building up from that, I think will be difficult as well. Okay. So Roger, I just want to end this with, because you've done this really nice methodical walkthrough of the evidence that we already know in the indictment, which of course will be built upon in subsequent filings and certainly at trial. What of the eight anchor lies, 16 ancillary lies, six red flags of bad faith, and nine instances of shocking malevolence do you think will be the most compelling for prosecutors use to use to win their case? Well, I do think it's the cumulative effect. And I think it's clear from the indictment that they are prepared with these. The eight anchor lies are the election lies, you know, things like 10,000 dead people voted in Georgia or, you know, umpteen thousand out of state people voted, you know, so and so. And in addition to showing that each of those had been debunked and debunked and debunked and debunked by the most, you know, authoritative people possible, what he's going to also show is that each of those lies was repeated at the ellipse on January 6th. And, and that's going to be powerful. 
you know, and, and he repeats it to an angry crowd that he summoned there and that he then tells, uh, go to the capital, fight like hell, or you won't have a country anymore. And although insurrection is not charged, if you look at paragraphs like 96 to 118 of that indictment, you could have charged insurrection. It's there. And, and I think that's going to be crushing. All right. I think that's a great place to leave it. Roger Parloff, Serafine Danani, Ben Wittes, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material Supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org slash support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Go Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.